Infrastructure investment has received more widespread attention in recent years because of increased congestion from road and air problems, because of high-profile infrastructure failures, and because of worries about energy security and climate change. These problems have moved infrastructure policy to the center of the national agenda. The United States now has the opportunity to channel public concern and frustration into a national infrastructure strategy that promotes infrastructure as a central component of long-term, broadly shared growth. The Hamilton Project strategy paper, written by Manasi Deshpande and myself, proposes such a strategy. We draw on the economic literature, including the five new papers being released today by the Hamilton Project. I'll spend just a few minutes now summarizing the strategy that we propose. The numerous problems with our infrastructure suggest that the optimal amount of infrastructure investment is likely higher than the amount that we're currently undertaking. Indeed, estimates of net investment in physical infrastructure, that is, new investment less the depreciation of existing capital, show a pronounced decline in net investment over time from an average of nearly 2.5% of GDP in the 1970s and 1980s to around 1% of GDP in the 1990s. That said, it is difficult to determine the appropriate level of spending with any confidence, and we do not attempt to estimate the appropriate level in this paper. Instead, we and the other papers being released today focus mostly on two other aspects of infrastructure policy, how to use existing infrastructure more efficiently and how to make better decisions about investing our current infrastructure dollars. This focus is not meant to discourage interest in the level of infrastructure investment overall, but we want to emphasize that improvements in these dimensions of infrastructure policy have the potential to yield very large benefits for the American people and for the U.S. economy. Let me be more specific, first as regards physical infrastructure and then concerning telecommunications infrastructure. Physical infrastructure, of course, includes roads and bridges, airports and the air traffic control system, water and sewage systems, and facilities for energy production and distribution. As one key step toward using our physical infrastructure more efficiently, we recommend establishing pricing mechanisms, such as road congestion fees and air traffic control fees, to make users bear the costs of their infrastructure use more fully. In addition, at least part of the revenue from these fees should be used to offset their potential adverse distributional impacts. For example, road congestion fees would cause drivers to pay for the traffic delays they impose on others, thereby encouraging drivers to shift their trips to other times or to reduce the number of less essential trips. But these fees would have a larger adverse effect on the budgets of low-income drivers than high-income drivers. So some of the revenue collected should be used to compensate low-income drivers. One way to combine congestion pricing with such compensation is presented in David Lewis's paper that you'll hear about shortly. Another example of pricing as a means of achieving more efficient infrastructure use is in Jason Bordoff and Pascal Noel's, Noel's paper today. They advocate switching the pricing of auto insurance to a per-mile basis from the current system of mostly flat rates. As they will show you, the result will be a notable reduction in miles driven. As a key step for making better decisions about infrastructure investments, we recommend in the strategy paper that the federal government remove distortions in its own policies and provide more flexibility to states and localities in exchange for more accountability. One proposal for improving decision-making about the infrastructure for air travel appears in today's paper by Dorothy Robine. She supports separating the operation and regulation of the air traffic control system and she will describe the advantages of that and the other changes that she proposes. Telecommunications infrastructure is a more recent source of concern for many people. This infrastructure includes the natural resource of the electromagnetic spectrum, as well as the constructed resources, such as telephone wires, cable lines, and equipment. Despite the high-tech wonders that many Americans enjoy, the United States, in fact, lags behind many industrial nations in high-speed Internet access and its economic and social benefits. 
One important step in making better use of our existing telecom infrastructure is to shift the allocation of wireless spectrum from industries and firms that had good historical reasons for controlling parts of the spectrum to those industries and firms that can put spectrum to the most valuable use today. To accomplish this, today's paper by Philip Weiser recommends that the government facilitate leases and sales of unused spectrum, and also that the government adopt a more flexible approach to avoiding interference among spectrum users. And he will describe that to you more fully later on. Another important consideration for telecommunications infrastructure is access. We recommend that the government consider targeted, cost-effective subsidies to encourage private firms to expand high-speed Internet access to unserved rural areas. Just as the government has facilitated low-cost mail delivery, electrification, and the provision of other services to rural areas, so it can facilitate access to the critical information source of the 21st century. In a paper today, John Piha will present an innovative auction mechanism for increasing high-speed Internet access at the lowest possible public cost. In conclusion, the nation's infrastructure problems are daunting, but solvable. Increased spending on infrastructure is likely to be part of the solution, perhaps as part of a short-term stimulus package, as Larry Summers discussed, perhaps or separately or in addition as part of a long-term strategy, as is being discussed uh, currently around the country. In addition to spending more money, though, we can reap tremendous advantages from simply using existing infrastructure more efficiently and by making better decisions about how to invest in infrastructure. As I said, using existing infrastructure more efficiently must start with setting appropriate prices so that users of infrastructure bear the costs of their use that they impose on other users of the infrastructure and on society more broadly. Making better decisions about how to invest in infrastructure needs to start with better mechanisms through which the federal government makes decisions, but also extend to better ways in which the federal government influences the decisions made by states and localities. And these themes, using infrastructure more efficiently and making investments uh, uh, more intelligently, are our themes uh, for today's conference.